Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard and my guest today is a longtime friend, Jay Wedker. He's out in San Diego. He's uh, my former mentor, although I still pick his brain quite often for different things. Um, he's a husband, he's a father. He is the founder and executive director for Grace uh, Gospel, Gospel for Life. It was one of those G's, <laughs> Gospel for Life. And uh, anyway, welcome to the show, Jay. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Richard. Uh, so glad you're serving the Lord back there. Pastoring is uh, one of the toughest jobs imaginable. So uh, <laughs> God's grace to you, my brother. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm actually uh, celebrating my 75th birthday in just a few weeks here. Oh, wow. I was saved when I was 25. So uh, it's basically going to be the big 5-0. I've been saved one half of a century. Wow. And uh, I was saved during the uh, flower child hippie movement all the way back then. I was not part of the uh, gigantic uh, ocean baptism, but uh, I was attending some of the uh, churches back there, famous churches, the uh, Calvary Chapel there in Orange County, pastored by uh, Pastor Chuck. Oh, yeah. But uh, the gentleman who was most instrumental in leading me to Christ was uh, actually in the gymnasium business, the health club business. He was uh, the developer of all the, all the nutrients for uh, these two health club chains. And I wanted to uh, leave the training division of the company and start in the nutritional division. And someone had told me that this gentleman who was buzzing around uh, California in his brand new Mercedes was a new believer himself. Wow. So uh, I brought that to his attention when he interviewed me for a job. And uh, he witnessed to me in a very firm way mm. that uh, if I did not repent, I would have uh, a life that was increasingly hellish here and then eternal hell afterwards. And so uh, I couldn't shake his witness. Uh, he did take me under his wing and train me. So uh, it was very much a relational kind of witnessing. So uh, I repented and found Christ as Savior when I was 25 years old. And that was in 1972. Mm, amen. That's great. Uh, tell us a little bit about your work there in San Diego. I know we knew each other in Santa Clarita, mainly, and you taught for um, Masters University and did a bunch of other things. I know you trained a long time ago as a graphic designer. You paint. Uh, I think... I, We've got a bond there. I know we both appreciate the arts, I think, a lot more maybe than the average Christian. Um, yeah. But tell, tell us a little bit just about your, your work, uh, that what you're doing there, both with your ministry and just even the local church and, and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Uh, my, how, my home is my art gallery as well as my studio and pastor's study. So mm. it serves double duty. In fact, this painting on the wall behind me here is uh, market, River Market Day in Bangkok, Thailand. So uh, I tend to bring my paints wherever I go when I'm traveling, doing traveling ministry around the world. Uh, I just love doing watercolor. It's been something I've been working on for a long, long time to, to reach a certain level of ability. Watercolor is very challenging because mm -hmm. uh, it's so easy for your paint to turn to mud. Mm. So the majority of my week is uh, actually in discipleship and teaching. Whenever I travel and do a conference, uh, a men's retreat or speak in another country, I'm almost always speaking on how to grow a culture of disciple making. Mm. So this is my real heartbeat, uh, discipleship. Uh, I started doing discipleship uh, not too long after I got saved. And one of the reasons why is because uh, I couldn't find the spiritual father figures I really needed. And uh, I didn't necessarily have a, a father, uh, a physical father who invested in me spiritually. Mm. So my hunger to replace that was just overwhelming. I found a man here and there who was willing to speak into my life. And then I had a major change, Richard. I decided that uh, I would start giving men what I so desperately needed myself. Mm. And uh, the Lord actually made that a huge part of my spiritual growth, my maturity, even my fulfillment. So uh, I, I just love doing men's ministry. I see that uh, when, when they're being ministered to, certain blockages in their sanctification are being addressed that uh, they're so grateful. And in many times, in many ways, this prepares them for a more fulfilling ministry, a fuller ministry, and even mm. prepares some of these single guys to find a life partner. Yeah. So uh, my, I'm also uh, on staff at my church. I do a lot of teaching and counseling at my church, training interns, uh, helping some of the men uh, 
develop the qualities necessary to become an elder, a shepherd. Mm. So that's how my week is divided up. Uh, discipleship, teaching and training, and painting. <laughs> nice. Amen. Amen. Um, when did you get, you got, you originally, weren't, you're not from San Diego, right? Or are you? I can't remember. Right. Now I'm actually from uh, Downey, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. That's and right. I, forgot, I forgot to add my week is also as an online professor for the master's university. That's right. Right on. So I teach worldview, apologetics, evangelism, and uh, principles of, of biblical discipleship are courses I teach at the, at the university. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, um, we laid out a few questions. I like to, obviously I know a lot of the answers to this, but just share it with my audience. Um, you've already kind of touched on a lot of your background. Um, how do you, you, what was it, or was it always something, again, this is kind of an affinity for both of us. And I know I've, I've taken aesthetics and other things in seminary and just, I appreciate good art, good stuff, whatever it is, not kitschy, cheesy stuff. Yeah. Um, how much, or let's say, how, how, what would you say to someone who says, you know, art is, art is worldly, art is of the devil, art is not good, whatever art, whether it's painting, music, uh, film, whatever it is, how do you, how do you deal with or approach and try and, and win that person to say, well, hold on, let's talk about that. Yeah. I, I like, uh, the work of a number of authors who address this. Um, one of them suggests that, uh, there was a time in human history where there was no barrier between the knowledge of God and redemptive culture. In other words, culture was an expression of God's relationship to the creation mm. in providing rainfall and seasons and all the equipment necessary to make cultural artifacts, uh, whether they're carvings or ceramics or precious metals. You look at how many, how many aesthetic movements there are in God's plan for the tabernacle. It's just remarkable. You look at how much aesthetics are involved in Solomon's temple. Mm. And uh, those are pure expressions of cultural artifacts that are pointing to the glory of God. He's the ultimate source of beauty, and he's the ultimate standard of beauty. So uh, Al Mohler has some good articles on this. He says that uh, a biblical doctrine of beauty uh, makes sure that uh, truth and beauty and goodness are always joined. Mm. Uh, the, world, the world has a false definition of beauty. And as such, uh, as Francis Schaeffer points out, that false definition, false definition of beauty may, uh, may contain a lot of nihilism, a lot of, uh, of uh, impurity, immorality, uh, an absurdity perspective that uh, we can even celebrate a pessimistic worldview. There is no hope. There's no coming restoration. Mm. So uh, this is one of the great benefits of studying biblical worldview is it gives you a lens of discernment. I've given about 12 different tours of the Getty Art Museum, the big, big, big one in Santa Monica. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, beautiful many, many, many Christians I've taken through there have very little experience in attending major galleries. So when they understand that the artist is actually communicating his worldview in a vocabulary of symbols and metaphors in, in the painting, it's a very exciting discovery for these people to be taken through the Getty Art Museum by a Christian professor <laughs> Yeah. It's so uh, since about 50 percent of the art at the Getty Museum has a Christian background or Christian themes, uh, I'm in some rooms and I get to preach the gospel. I'll point out yeah. a painting uh, of Christ being interrogated by torchlight while he's being tormented. And uh, mm. in fact, I had some students I was taking through the art, the art museum, and some of these students were unsaved students who were Muslim. So in, in, according to their Islam, that would be a horrendous thing to paint a yeah. painting of their religious leader being mocked and, and covered with reproach. Mm. So on the way, on the way back uh, home from the gallery, one of the Muslim students asked this question, why in the world would someone want to paint a painting of your God, your savior being mocked, reproached and, and made fun of. And of course, that's just a nice slow pitch in the strike zone to preach. The <laughs> right. <body>. Seriously. <laughs> So we basically explained to him that uh, 
every speck of torment, reproach, ignominy he was bearing was actually as a substitute for the people. Mm. We got we got to preach the gospel to him. Oh, amen. So oh, this this good. great this great question that you've asked. Um, why why are the art why the cultural arts something that Christians ought to consider? Um, and there's a bit of a debate on this. I mean, Nancy Piercy believes that uh, culture ought to be redeemed by Christians. We don't relinquish it to the world. But uh, there are some conservative professors I work with that uh, believe that Christians need not waste their time trying to redeem culture. We've got a bigger task, and that's to uh, be Christ's servants in preaching the gospel and growing the church. Yeah. Uh, there certainly is a place for us speaking into culture and uh, acknowledging the beautiful, the redemptive, the useful things that, that, are, that make up culture. Um, I like what one of our professors says at the Master's University. Uh, the moment you use a palm frond or a piece of bamboo or a bone for something other than God created it, you're making culture. Mm. Even, a yeah. thatched, even a thatched hut is culture. Even a woven basket is culture. Even a ceramic pot is culture, culture making artifacts. Mm. That's a good point. I mean, and that and that's the funny thing that, you know, especially in the last near two years of just kind of a, an, a revelation, as it were, an apocalypse, really, not obviously eschatological per se, but uh, just a revealing of not just the church, but the, the world and politics and just not just the hypocrisy, because that's just it's just, you know, 10 miles thick, but the the things that people have seen that are important and the things that aren't important um and kind of drawing lines where we didn't have lines before or erasing or moving other lines and you know there's people that would of course say yeah of course, that's not that's not art that's not culture that's not anything that's just people living well then you could say well of course so is painting so is building a nice house so is having a nice uh meal placed in front of someone and having the proper care for a steak and a potato and the vegetable and this and this and preparing it in such a way that you're having a guest and you want to give them excellence. And that's, that's always been my argument for a lot of people of uh, God, God's excellent. I mean, he cares about beauty. Look at the green grass and the blue sky. Look at the mountains, look at the valleys. Of course he cares about beauty. He could have made everything Brown. Everything could just be grayish blah and with no flavor on our, why do we have taste buds? I mean, there's so many different things. But I think the fun thing is to kind of push back a little bit on people's artificial lines. And most people would say, oh, a bone and this and a hut. That's not culture. That's not art. That's just whatever. Well, it is. And you have an excellent point. It is art. It is. So is painting. So is design in all sorts of capacities. So writing. Yeah, Rich, being, being yeah. Richard, just weighing in on this. I think <clears throat> one of the problems with Christians being comfortable around cultural statements is they, they have often felt safer adhering to a sacred-secular split. Mm, it's this no. sacred-secular split allows them to kind of keep a holy huddle and not uh, defile themselves by looking at culture or studying culture or appreciating culture, mm. when actually there's countless redemptive things, you know, beautiful symphonies put on by classical composers, you know, playing the music of classical composers and so on and so I believe that the lack of developing biblical worldview has contributed to the fear of culture and the sacred secular split. Mm. I think uh, the more fully as someone develops a biblical worldview, the more confident and bold they'll be in applying that discernment to cultural statements because culture carries, culture is a matrix that carries a worldview statement. Whether it's That's impressionism, right. post-impressionism, no matter what it is, it carries a worldview statement. And so, wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a worldview that was developed enough that you could have a, a lens of discernment, uh, a toolbox to be able to uh, analyze and detect what particular worldview is being communicated by a cultural artifact? Mm. I mean, then you wouldn't have to uh, protect yourself from every cultural statement. You'd be able to discern. Yeah. yeah, that's and that's one of the reasons kind of why I even have my channel of being against the world and kind of pushing against it. But but for it in the sense of, yeah, but there's also a better answer, right? Christ is king. He is the creator and he's redeemed these, these everything, right? Uh, but particularly uh, those who trust and have turned to him. But there'll be a new creation, but it doesn't mean we kind of sit back 
and, and on our on our couches, as it were. What do you think? And we'll just as kind of a sub point of this. It's always fun to analyze and look back and think this or that this caused this and so on. What do you think? When was it um, that really people started to divide? Like you know the a lot of, like you just said composers, uh, artists. Even if they weren't Christian, although many were, they still had this deep appreciation for the Bible and just truth and a transcendent reality. When did people really start to make that distinction? And I would say particularly in North America, in the United States proper, that people started to see this fun, fundamentalist whatever. Like I've heard stories of you know people at, at Moody um, – Bible Institute or Wheaton or uh, King's College in New York City, where they used to have rules. You could not go to the theater. You could not go to the movies. You couldn't do these things. You couldn't, you know, women had to wear dresses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all these certain, you know, rules. When was it that really started to, that, that took off and what was the impetus behind it? You have any ideas on that? Sure. Uh, I'd probably go back 500 years. I'm not going to take a long <laughs> time to do this, but, uh, it's interesting that there was a somewhat good kind of humanism mm -hmm. that uh, was a parallel discovery at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And that good kind of humanism, basically some of those individuals who influenced Martin Luther were humanist Catholic scholars. And as humanist Catholic scholars, they said, you know, uh, these years of, of feudalism, that particular medieval period, uh, the individual was lost in the institution. The individual did not matter. Everything mm. was almost a Christian collectivism where the individual was lost in the institution. Humanism actually was a rediscovery that God can work directly with an individual. And th this is the kind of teaching that, that Luther was, was, you know, flowering under as opposed to everybody lost in the institution. So that kind of humanism really helped Luther recover the doctrine of justification so that a person could be saved by hearing and believing the gospel, even if it didn't take place through the machinery of the institution, the church. Mm -hmm. And uh, Calvin, a generation later, you could almost say Calvin's institutes were the recovery of the role of the Holy Spirit in the believer's salvation, sanctification, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the church had usurped the role of the spirit and said, no, the, it, the, mother, the mother church will do everything that the spirit does. That's why mm. you need us. That's why your salvation can only come through us. Wow. So the Protestant Reformation was a rediscovery of justification by faith, uh, the work of the spirit, the sufficiency of Christ's work, and the actual real use of the ordinances, not as means of saving grace, but as celebrations of the grace that had already taken place. So Humanism had a part in contributing to the discovery that God could save an individual by the gospel. Hard to believe that was lost. But the humanism also had an expression in the Italian Renaissance. In that particular expression, uh, we see the uh, that was typified in, in the work of Michelangelo. Uh, his, his sculpture of David was basically a humanistic statement. Mm -hmm. Here, here's, a, here's a naked man with nothing to be ashamed of with his hands outsized compared to the rest of his body by ratio. These hands can create temples, uh, skyscrapers, uh, industry, empires. Mm. It's man, it's man uh, the, you know, majestically controlling his world. And so the Protestant Reformation, of course, paralleled the invention of the printing press. Uh, the Bible was put in the, in the hands of people. And uh, the great theme that Francis Schaeffer brings out, grace versus nature, started to change. Uh, as, as Francis Schaeffer said, nature began to eat up grace. Mm. Nature began to eat up grace. And so our utter dependency upon God for everything, even for uh, thought and logic and reasoning and epistemology, that began to uh, take a back seat. And so uh, mm. the Enlightenment, which was an anti-supernatural movement, it was a movement that basically company <clears throat> empiricism that uh it enthroned the reason of man man has the power to study the facts and come up with their interpretation without the need of divine revelation mm. and one of the most subtle contributors to this thinking was uh the founder of the scientific method francis bacon 
Francis Bacon, who died uh, in the early part of the 17th century, died right around 1625. But Francis Bacon said something that most Christians today would have no trouble with. Francis Bacon said this in 1620, in uh, 16, early 1600s. He said, uh, God has given Britain two great books, the Bible and science. Mm. And if she, is, if she is faithful to both, she shall be great. And mm. most Christians would have no problem with that. But inherent in his statement was a kind of empiricism that basically said facts contain their own interpretation. And we have the power to interpret these facts without referring to divine revelation. Wow. So uh, this was a huge problem because uh, we know that the, the top <laughs> scholars in, in worldview today have spelled out how wonderful it is that special revelation, God's word, corrects our misinterpretation of general revelation. General revelation is adequate to hold you guilty, hold you accountable, because God has spoken inerrantly in creation and conscience. But any wrong interpretations you have of general revelation ought to be corrected by special revelation. But, but uh, Francis Bacon put way too much hope upon the human intellect. And uh, this uh, led Ken Ham to write an article called Bacon versus Ham. <laughs> I highly recommend the article because it basically introduces uh, some of Francis Bacon's empiricism, mm. why it began to mill militate against a doctrine of our utter dependency and epistemology where we're utterly dependent upon special revelation. And so uh, in my tracing the history up to this, I have uh, forgotten part of your question. <laughs> if, you, if you could just no. give me the uh, short version again. Yeah, no, just, I, I mean, that's all wonderful. And such, it's always, I love history and it's such, it's yeah. so essential for us to be constantly reminded of of this and that and this idea and yes. you know just like today people will look back a hundred years from now and say what what were you guys doing why were you doing that and not this and the other and it's hard because you, you're in you know the forest and the trees analogy like we're stuck and we're like how do we really figure this out so it's good history is wonderful but the question really uh, uh, primarily was how or rather why and when did things start to separate? You yeah, know, was yeah, it I mean, was it the fundamentalist, you know, liberalism fundamentalist debate in yeah, the, in nineteen twenties? Was it before you know, that? Something, something preceded that, and, and of course, I require the book "Total Truth" by Nancy Piercy. That's yeah. a required book for my worldview course, and of course, Nancy Piercy, being a student of Francis Schaeffer. Uh, in many ways, she's brought the truths that Francis Schaeffer spelled out so beautifully. She's brought those truths into the 21st century. Mm. And, and Piercy says, you have to recognize this, that uh, the philosopher most responsible for splitting the Western mind was Immanuel Kant. Mm. Now, here's the reason why. Uh, when we say split the Western mind, we mean a big division between facts and values, a big division between the subjective and the objective, a big division between upper story and lower story. And so this splitting of the mind essentially had the effect of shoving Christianity's truth claims into an upper story subjective category, which the world regards merely as preference and not connected to total truth. So Francis, I'm sorry, uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, <clears throat> Many people regarded him to be a genius because he was able to reconcile. He didn't really reconcile, but he was able to reconcile the empiricists with the universalists. Universalists wanted to talk about the universal ideas by which we organize facts. And the empiricists basically said facts stand on their own. We don't need any universals to organize them or interpret them. So here's how Immanuel Kant reconciled the two. Um, he said that facts, and I'm speaking for him, I'm actually using words he did not use, but facts are like beads that don't have holes drilled in them. Mm. There's no real way to organize them. They're just an independent atomic, you know, it's atomistic mass of details. Universals are like the string upon which facts can be strung, like a pearl necklace. And so 
essentially Kant is saying, your mind provides the universals by which facts are organized, strong in a sequence. Your minds provide the universals. They don't come from anywhere else. In other words, the universals, the transcendentals necessary to organize facts are merely your subjective ideas. The only thing that has concrete existence that's quantifiable are the facts themselves. And so he threw a sop at both the empiricists and the universalists. And this split the Western mind. In fact, any college student today can parrot that two level view of truth where facts and values have two different existences entirely. And uh, this was huge. Piercy says you can't understand Western culture. You can't understand postmodernism. You can't understand relativism. You can't understand postmodernism's hatred of a meta narrative. You cannot understand any of that if you don't understand how the Western mind was split. That's good. No, that's good. Um, yeah, Total Truth is a good book. I think I've started it twice, but I don't know if I finished <laughs> it. <laughs> it is. It's a little thicker. Um, yeah. What? Uh, I guess just briefly, and you've kind of touched on it already. Um, what was it that really made you say, yes, I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going into pastoral Christian worldview. I want to contend for the faith and not just, just, you know, go be a designer or a painter or work at a bank. What was it that really kind of the kind of circumstances that, that led you to kind of push you into the place you're in? Yeah, the gentleman that uh, was so instrumental in leading me to the Lord, this man who was in the health club business, uh, I used to drive down to San Diego. He rented a huge cabin. He had a family of six kids. Rented this huge cabin up in the mountains here above San Diego in apple country. Mm. And I would go hiking with him on a regular basis. And uh, one day we're hiking. We went to the summit of this mountain. We're looking out over the great view. And he said, you know, of all the guys I led to the Lord and disciple, you love scripture the most, you really should go to Bible college and study under the top creation scientists in the West. So uh, I took that as from the Lord and I went to Christian Heritage College, studied under these, these great scientists. And uh, it was exactly what I needed because before I was saved, I was majoring in zoology. I was a pre-med major at Long Beach State University. Oh. So uh, I believed in a form of theistic evolution and, uh, I even used my theistic evolution as an excuse to live the lifestyle of a party going fraternity guy. Uh, and so I saw that uh, worldview really translates into a style of living or, or, or almost an excuse to live an amoral lifestyle. Mm. So what really motivated me was I wanted all my hunger for science to be examined by scripture. And uh, surprisingly, uh, my professors at the at my professors at Long Beach State University uh, asked us to read a book called Earth in Upheaval by Velikovsky. And that particular book, even back then, was a book that countered uniformitarianism. It was a book that actually supported catastrophism, a book that supported that Earth's natural history is filled with gigantic catastrophes. And this would support the flood of Noah. And so my hunger to uh, put this information into the hands of Christians uh, was part of my motivation. I saw how great the need was. I had a mind that loved science. I wanted to see how things fit together. And so I was uh, sort of a tireless student of uh, biblical creation and so on. So mm -hmm. I was wired to study science. I like to see how things go together. And the Lord had just filled me with an overflowing gratitude for my salvation. And so, uh, I just really wanted to use the teaching gift he'd given me. I saw how great the need was, and that was enough to uh, move me into that discipline. Awesome. So you say you went, your undergrad then is it, uh, what was it, Heritage? Christian well, Heritage? Well, I, I, have a, I have a degree in Bible from, from Christian Heritage College, but I also studied uh, zoology and fine art at Long Beach State University. Oh, okay. And then you went to seminary at Master's, right? Master's Seminary? Right. Okay. right. Awesome. Um, and this obviously, this next one kind of goes without saying, it's pretty obvious, yeah. but the pitfalls, <clears throat> whether they're obvious or not, um, 
because I again I know a lot of Christians. We were talking before we went live uh, or started recording. Um, a lot of people, and again, we don't want to be the salvation police in one sense because you don't know the heart, right? And obviously, there's fruit and fruit ex- inspection, as it were. But sometimes people can be stuck in sin, or they can just be damaged, or they're just you know beat up, or they don't like you said, they don't have a good foundational Christian worldview, a biblical worldview. Uh, what are the pitfalls of that? Uh, I know we could probably list 4,000 or you could list, you know, that many or more, but what are the, what are the disadvantages? What are the things of saying, yeah, I just, I'm still going to read my Bible. I'm still going to go to my, you know, guys group, my ladies group. We're, we're still going to do this, this, the typical denominational stuff. I'm still going to do my whatever thing, but nothing more. I'm not going to read total truth. I'm not going to, I'm not going to challenge and look at history. I'm not going to do these other things to try and really see where I'm lacking. What, what are the pitfalls? What are the dangers of not having a a biblical worldview? Yeah. Let's say that uh, your question is a question that applies to a true believer, right? Is that what you're, you're asking? What are the pitfalls for a true believer? Okay. Somebody who knows they're a sinner, they love Jesus, but they're just, yeah. Yeah. I, Richard, I'd say the very first uh, pitfall would be a privatized Christianity, a Christianity that is in a very small, tight bubble that uh, is not able to engage our culture. And uh, this basically means you're running a defense and not an offense. You're, mm-hmm. you're not really developing spiritual weapons that can tear down the fortresses raised up against the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. And so this privatized Christianity is essentially in a retreat mode. And, and it really lays the foundation for living a life of sin management rather than actually being salt and light and uh, making a real change in our culture. Mm. So when, when a person uh, lacks biblical discernment from a well-developed biblical worldview, uh, it's very easy to live a compartmentalized Christianity. And in that situation, uh, truth and life become separated. Faith and practice become separated. It almost opens up a chasm, a, a, tend, a tear, a rend in one's Christian experience. And so I, I am convinced that a it's worth the time to develop a biblical unified worldview because it does produce a unified Christian experience, a unified Christian walk in so many ways. I mean, we forget just how much uh, we are to love God with our minds. I mean, mm-hmm. God wants our intellect. I, I was talking to one pastor the other day and he says, uh, you know, why is it that the life of the mind in terms of imagination is, is so yielded to movies and video games and things like that. Why don't you boot up your mind and think about the glory of eternity, to think about the beauty of Christ, to think about what it's going to be like to be in the kingdom. We, we seldom use our imagination for even meditating on, on these biblical wonders. And so uh, part of this weakness of uh, or pitfall of not having a well-developed biblical worldview is that it kind of goes back to how so many fundamentalist churches communicated religious truth. Uh, they, they did their religious training primarily in a devotional context. A devotional context means everything was, was basically a measure of your level of piety, how strict you're going to be about righteousness and sin. And, uh, and in fact, this is one of the reasons why uh, Christianity became so marginalized in America between, and I'll establish these dates sort of the way Dr. Peter Jones does, um, Christianity began to be marginalized radically at the end of the 1920s. And uh, prior to that, um, you could almost say even in our universities prior to the 1920s, it was assumed that uh, the truth that is in the Bible describes what is out there. It's a faithful, faithful uh, study and representation of what's out there in terms of human experience. And so because religious training took place in a context of devotional, in other words, everything was related to pietism, because of that, uh, it was not seen as total truth. It was basically seen as spiritual advice. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's just a phenomenal article by uh, Vishal Mangalwadi. He's considered by Christianity today as the most important Christian intellectual of all of India, Mm -hmm. 1.4 billion people. Uh, Vishal Mangalwadi is probably the most... uh, recognized Christian intellectual. And he wrote an article called How the Church Lost America by Becoming a Religion of Faith Rather than a Religion of Truth. And so this is basically a condemnation of of this devotional approach to uh, biblical truth. 
And so this was a movement away from total truth. And uh, the pitfalls from this particular approach are manifold. Again, I, I said it puts people in a, a mode of retreat. Uh, you're unable to set up an antithesis between God's word and the, the deadly lies of our culture. You're not really learning how to use antithesis in your evangelism, your apologetics, your instruction in the next rising generation. And so I would say those two or three pitfalls are the ones that come to mind first. Mm. That's good. That's no, good. And I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I really, I, I strongly agree uh, yeah. because, you know, even being here in Kentucky for a good amount of time now um, and having preached at a number of churches, just random places and just, you know, the conversations in seminary and, and just, you can, and even in churches and other, you hear and see certain stuff that, you know, I heard about in California, you know, and of course, California, land of fruits and nuts, right? I love that, love that phrase. But, um, you know, denominations, it's kind of, we were always, at least for me, and it's still, I think, is the case. It's very kind of, well, those Baptists, those Southern, well, those Presbyterians, uh, you know. and, you know, we're just about the Bible, which is true. And, but I would say that, you know, every Christian would say that to a degree, but the focus is what are we going to do with this? scripture because a lot of times i'll hear people and i'll hear this even in, in our local church you know i just, just want to learn more i want to do more uh i want to um you know know what i'm supposed to do sort of thing you know and and there are several verses that talk about this is god's will for you you know your sanctification is one of them like and and this level of yeah there is this personal piety but how does that work and i've said this recently from the pulpit um, that we're so often thinking, well, you know, if God would just send revival, you know, as if that happens all the time or something. And I would, I would, you know, there's a wonderful historical study that, you know, we could go into of the pros and the cons of both the first and second great awakening, but, uh, and the floodgates that that opened, but regardless, we always think it's going to be out there. It's out there. It's somewhere else. It's upstate New York. It's down in the Everglades. It's somewhere else. It's not here. And it's certainly not me loving my wife or my children. It's certainly not doing basic things. And then also calling out, you know, the sin in our whatever, or living unto the Lord and reading scripture and applying this or that to those things that are just these daily bricks that we build. We just kind of think it's just to be this big once for all thing that somebody else should do. And it's not right. It is, it is faith. It is learning and devotion, but it's also having your mind renewed, having your mind sharpened and working in what's going on in the world. Right. And seeing, knowing the Bible well enough to apply it to whatever's going on, you know, whether the government says you should shut down your church or whether you should not sing or whether you should, you know, not go here or go there, or we own your children. You don't, that sort of thing. Most Christians aren't prepared to answer those basic questions. And uh, I think a lot of it is just, you know, this personal devotional thing. And good, bad, or otherwise, how that's all happened. You know, it's multiple different people over multiple different years. But, yeah, it's, 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 it's evident for sure. Um, you mentioned total truth. You mentioned Nancy Piercy, uh, of course, Francis Schaefer, two of my favorites, especially Schaefer. Um, <clears throat> what would you recommend to the audience uh, who they're thinking, yeah, I think you're right. I think that might, that might, that might be me, but what am I supposed to do? What I mean? Okay. Read the Bible more, but this is just black ink on a white page. How am I supposed to really you know, uh, I mean, I read the Gospel of John again. I, I'm, I, you know, we're, my pastor's working through Acts. You know, I know Genesis kind of well. But what am I supposed to do with all this? How do I, what more can I do? Give some, you have some examples of either books or even classes, questions to ask, maybe even to help, you know, people self-diagnose uh, how much or how little of a, of a Christian biblical worldview they have. Yes. Uh, one of the things we use in my class uh, that I teach, the apologetics part of the class of worldview, is how to ask ultimate questions. Uh, an ultimate question would be, 
where do we come from? Why do humans have value? What is a human being? Why is there evil death and suffering? What happens when you die? Is God knowable? Is there a design or purpose for human beings? These are all ultimate questions. And when I say ultimate questions, these are questions about reality. Mm -hmm. None of these questions can be answered by going to a laboratory and putting something in a test tube. None of these questions can be answered by looking under a microscope. These are the transcendentals. These are the ultimates that are traceable to your view of reality. So using ultimate questions, raising ultimate questions, uh, asking ultimate questions of an unbeliever, and then showing him how his answer is in direct contradiction to the word of God, setting up an antithesis between these ultimate questions, uh, is just a tremendous way to have a person's worldview scrutinized. I spoke at a uh, Dr. Peter Jones think tank, and about all I did was uh, talk about how to use ultimate questions in evangelism. Mm. So, uh, and I've used this countless times with unsafe people on campuses, professional people, people I run into at Starbucks. I will ask them, uh, hey, I'm a professor from another school. Uh, would you mind if I asked you a couple of questions about your worldview? Did you know there's only four questions that'll reveal anybody's worldview no matter where you are on the planet? They go, okay, I'll, I'll try. So the first question is, uh, where do we come from? Where do human beings come from? Second question, what are we? What is our significance? What is our value? What's it based on? Third question, what's gone wrong with the world? Fourth question, can anything be done to fix it? If so, what? Mm. And so uh, I, I've done entire conferences on evangelism, just sharing stories from the trenches on how people attempted to answer these questions and how it opened up uh, a perfect opportunity for me to preach the gospel. And so uh, these ultimate questions are closely tied to the five or six beats of redemptive history. And so someone that needs to develop a biblical worldview, I would say get familiar with how to answer these questions, I, these four questions I just asked. And also look at these five or six beats of redemptive history, creation, fall, redemption, judgment, restoration. Those are the five beats, creation, fall, redemption, judgment, restoration. And, uh, I think uh, Ken Ham adds a couple more to these five beats. He has creation, fall, flood, babel, redemption, judgment, kingdom restoration. And so uh, I, I refer to this as God's glory story. This is God's plot. Mm. I mean, let's let's if, if history ends here in terms of the coming kingdom within the next few centuries, that will mean there's really only been. 6,000 or so years of time between two bookends of eternity past and eternity future. And so uh, we could say that this redemptive history is God's plot. And to be a saved person is to be invited into God's plot, to mm. participate in his plot. And uh, this, this is how we think about the big picture. So I'd say the first thing you need to do is, is start studying these topics in the Bible, these five beats of redemptive history. I would also say, uh, Start reading some excellent books on worldview. I'll give you a few titles here. I have, I've written down 15. I'll try to just pick a few from this, of course, Nancy Piercy's book. And then uh, the book that made your world by Vishal Mongol Wadi. It's another required text in our class. Uh, a really scholarly work is Andrew Hoffaker, Building a Worldview. Another scholarly work, Abraham Kuyper, Lectures on Calvinism. Um, J.P. Moreland, Love God with All Your Mind. Francis Schaeffer, How Should We Then Live? Uh, James Sire, The Universe Next Door. Uh, Herbert Schlossberg, Turning Point, A Christian Worldview Declaration. Robert Raymond, The Justification of Knowledge. Uh, Tom Notaro, Van Til and the Use of Evidence, excellent book. John Frame, Apologetics to the Glory of God. Um, Will Metzger, Tell the Truth. Peter Jones, God of Sex. And then uh, there's a book that's come out in the last couple of years by Greg Kukul. And it is phenomenal. It's, it's the best. It's a less than 200 pages. It's called The Story of Reality. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, it's on anybody, my desk. <laughs> yeah. Have you read it? I've, I've yeah, I've started it. <laughs> I've well, got quite a few that I just, I'm like, yeah, I just need to do this. And then I'll get distracted with something else. But no, I, yeah, I it's on my desk any, at church. I would say to anyone who wants to develop a, a biblical worldview, this is a phenomenal starting point. Uh, it's so accessible, so encouraging, very readable. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it'll thrill you with how you can use worldview in apologetics. So uh, those are some starting points. 
I would recommend. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. Do you have um, kind of just wrapping up what, what book of the Bible, probably a tougher question maybe, but what book of the Bible most exemplifies a Christian biblical worldview that someone can say, okay, but we're Christians. We love the Bible. I want to read the Bible first. Sure. Schaefer, Kokel, Frame. Great. Cool. Good, 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 good. But what, what, what should I read in the Bible to really kind of get my hands and bearings afresh on, on this topic? Yeah. Um, I wrote uh, some curriculum. It's called Praying Our Worldview from the Psalms. Mm. And uh, what I did is I isolated 14 foundation stones, 14 building blocks of worldview from the Psalms. And you'd be surprised. The topic of uh, eternity, judgment, uh, the fear of God, and on and on it goes. So the creation, the fall, um, the attitude of the unreliever, unbeliever. There's so many in there. I, I, I isolated 14 of them, and I'm currently teaching this at my church, uh, how to pray your worldview from the Psalms, these 14 building blocks. And so uh, that's a great place to start. I just isolated a couple of Psalms here, Richard, that uh, would feed into that. Psalm 2, Psalm 19, Psalm 33 and 34, Psalm 39, Psalm 90, Psalm 104, Psalm 145. Each of these psalms has a particular aspect of biblical worldview taught very clearly, albeit in a doxological context. Mm. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are some chapters which are almost worldview tutorials all by themselves. One of those would be Romans chapter 1. Uh, such a clear description of uh, how truth produces fruit that is eternal and how error produces destruction, damnation, and bad fruit. Uh, there's some other chapters that uh, have a wonderful worldview summary. Of course, John, uh, Acts 17, Paul's sermon on the Oropagus at Mars Hill to the Athenian philosophers, uh, has all the points of biblical worldview in them as well, uh, just in a short theology that he gives. So Acts 17, Romans chapter 1, and then uh, I'd say all, all the uh, biblical books that um, have a prologue with Christ as creator, John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, tremendous places to start. And then the fact that uh, a new mind is needed, a new nature is needed, a regeneration is needed. Otherwise, the natural man will not and cannot interpret the facts of life to the glory of God. He cannot interpret God's world truthfully until he receives a new mind. And so uh, the necessity of the new birth and uh, how it produces an understanding of God's world, 1 Corinthians 2. 12 and then of course the last verse in that chapter uh the incredible gift of being given the mind of christ that's good no thank you um well i'll put all those description or all those links and stuff for the audience in the description books and whatnot um because a lot of times it's hard to track all that stuff down well sure. do you have any you have anything closing jay you want to share with with us any encouraging words from from the absolutely, people, the absolutely. people's republic of california <laughs> Uh, if we if we developed a biblical worldview, a, a thorough biblical worldview, it would give us so much more boldness in evangelism. Mm. I mean, because of the pressure put on us with with homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, all these phobias. In other words, Christians are described as if they're the pandemic, they're the virus, they're they're the virus that's attacking freedom and free speech and so on. And so, if we don't have a biblical worldview. Uh, we will tend to backpedal, imagining that our truth statements are merely ar arbitrary and not actually the cosmology and telos of the universe. And so uh, I use a little example. I draw an iceberg, and an iceberg is 90% underwater. And so we see the behavior, we see the dogmatism, we see the, the shrill statements the unbeliever is making, but we don't see the 90% of the iceberg below the waterline. And uh, the, the very tip of the iceberg under the water is this. Your starting point is either God or self. And if your starting point is self, you are going to choose presuppositions that do not come from the facts. They come from a heart commitment. And so even these scientists that have multiple doctorates, uh, oh, wow, are they the experts? Are they the authorities? No, they have heart commitments, which has, have caused them to pick anti-God, an anti-God hypothesis. And so 
Heart commitments, if you start with self, you will always have futile reasoning. If you start with self, you'll always have foolish thinking. You'll always have love of darkness. You'll always be a studious suppressor of the truth. And so this is true of every single unregenerate person. And uh, I, I really like uh, this particular statement uh, from a former professor at Grace Seminary. Uh, God has created man to recognize his truth the moment he sees it, even if he has fallen. Mm. Even fallen, totally depraved man recognizes God's truth the moment he sees it. And uh, that would really encourage us because uh, I think a lot of believers today think that the unbeliever has no more reason to believe in Jesus than in uh, Baha'u'llah or Buddha or Muhammad. When actually he knows what the truth is, he must studiously suppress it to try to keep it from his peripheral vision. And so uh, I, I have just seen the development of biblical worldview to be such a powerful tool in creating boldness and compassion for evangelism. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, I appreciate it, Jay. Thank you so much. It was good seeing you face to face. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, let's, we'll catch up more and um, yeah, I appreciate the time and, and uh, that's it. <laughs> we'll Sounds see you later. good, brother. I really right. appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Take care. Have a good day.